You're. Okay, we're live. Uh, Mazel Tov, man. You know, thank you so much. I just wanted to, I just wanted to say the Kaffa Kelly. Uh, what about it? It's quite a ride. You know, there's a lot of things to it, but it's like you go from heretic to, to you know, to believer, to heretic, to believer, like a million times in the course of praying yeah. when things are, when things are, are, are hard. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it is like prayer. Where's that quote from? Prayer is like war, right? Yeah. Do you remember who said that? I don't remember who said it, but it, ma it makes sense. It makes sense. Can I tell you, speaking of war, I was at the Kotel today, and I had this elaborate plan to say the entire book of the Hillen for your brother. And uh, it was already kind of late. You know, and I wanted to get back to, you know, do this podcast. So I basically said, if, like, you know, 12 to Hillam or 13. Yeah. And uh, my friend, Ari Lewis, the one, you know, that we do the interviews. Mm -hmm. There was like, he's like, hey, man, you got to come talk to these guys. There was like basically a couple of these proselytizers at the Kotel. Mm. That is illegal according to Israeli law. They're not so, going to enforce that. What? The Israelis are not going to enforce that. They they didn't, didn't, yeah, it, it, it was crazy. Like the, it, the guys weren't like, you know, they weren't like fairly tame guys. These, this one guy from Netherlands and another guy from America. <coughs> and um, I came up to them at one point after like a little Haredi kid was trying to get them out. And I'm like, guys, you realize you, what you're doing here is illegal. It's like, what? Anyone's a lot to be here. I'm like, you can be here, but you can't proselytize. We're not proselytizing. Da, 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 this, you know, they're basically trying to like subvert, you know? Uh -huh. And I was like, guys, listen, I know what you're doing. I'm not a cop, but if the cops come here, I, I yeah, I mistakenly thought, you know, if the cops know you're doing this, they're going to kick you out. So don't say you weren't warned. So what happened? Like, a bunch of Haredim basically surrounded them and they chased them out. The <laughs> cops, the cops, what we found out later, we ran into them actually on the way back to where I'm staying. We ran into them and apparently the cops just kind of like peacefully escorted them out. And the guy from Netherlands was like, yeah, they just like were very nice to us, you know, unlike the like Haredi guys who like yelled at us. And I'm like, you should be yelled at, you know, I was like, it's just, a, and then they started to start, you know, about the gospel and this, and, the, you know, you know, yeah, Yoshka said we'd be persecuted if we try, you know, in the future, or whatever. I'm, I'm just, I wanted to tell the, I didn't want to even get into discussion. I didn't have the call for it, you know? Yeah. But I wanted to say, do you know what persecution is? <laughs> what you just experienced at the Kotel was not persecution. It was a bunch of Haredi guys yelling at you. What persecution is what you did to us for like, I don't know, a thousand years. 1500 years. Can I like, tell you? Yeah. That the phrase, you just said a phrase which caused me joy. A bunch mm -hmm. of Haredi guys chased them away. How often mm -hmm. do you hear that? So I'll tell you something. No, well, when there's something that is like clearly, when it's like, I, I've seen this before, you know, and I told my friend, and I told Ari, I'm like, don't, people should not get confused that, you know, they think Haredi guys are like these scrawny yolis. Because you know what? When they get in the group, 50, 60 of them, you know, like, don't, don't get it twisted, man. It's not going to be fun for you. Like, it's, it's, it's not going to be fun. <laughs> Just once, I want to hear, like, yeah, a group of Haredi guys stomp this guy out. I'm like, what? Really? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> it's, <laughs> they didn't stomp him out, but, you know, that's the thing. They, these guys, the only one who was, like, trying to kind of get violent a little bit was, um, what is it called? It was, it was this little kid. And one of these guys, you know, one of the proselytizer guys, he had, he had like, a, like a whiteboard. He was writing stuff on it. That's where it's like obvious. It's like, dude, you're not just here to pray. You're here to like write stuff and show us stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and the little kid was trying to like push them. And, and, and eventually like somebody got it out of their hands and, and you know, broke it. And uh, 
yeah, I mean, you know, they, they, they didn't want to get violent, but it was, they, they just basically was like, then they started with the whole screaming, you know, how they do with the uh, women of the wall kind of thing. Yeah. They kind of yell at them. It was, you know, it was pretty impressive. I was like, wow, these guys, you know, again, they're fighting for Hashem. You know, they're not violent guys, like, you know, these Haredim, but when, when it comes to Hashem, when it comes to Halacha, when it comes to things that are like, you know, offending the Torah, that's yeah. it. That's the, that's the red line. <laughs> um, just interesting to like, I don't know, partake in it. And these guys like, you lie to your face. You know, they're like, no, we're not, like, it's obvious what you're doing, bro. Like, don't. <laughs> And then they're like, uh, yeah. They're like, oh, I'm like, where are you guys staying? And they're like, oh, we just like sleep in a tent. You know, just simple life, you know, as we spread the word, the good word. I'm like, oh, goodness gracious. I, I didn't have the energy. I just had to like, go home, you know. I could have stood there with them for like 30 minutes, an hour, just like basically doing the whole like, you know, the Tovia singer stick with them. Yeah. But uh, I, Those I, kind I, of I, guys. I'm not yeah. saying every Christian because I've spoken to I've spoken to like normal Christians, you know. Mm -hmm. Those guys aren't normal, mm -mm. you know. You can and, tell they're not normal. Yeah, and I find I find a similarity between those guys and like Antifa and left wing kooks. Yeah, because it's almost like you know you could see like Klaus Schwab laughing. He goes, ha, 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 "I yeah. have a great." Yeah. Even against you, I have millions of serious idiots who you don't have the energy <laughs> to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> I, my, that's my main weapon. Idiots yeah. that you don't have the energy yeah. to deal with. Or you don't have the time. You don't like like again, like the like when I went for Shabbos today, uh today, last Shabbos. And you know, I was like debating with my parents' friends, one of the sons. I don't have the time to research this stuff. And he was talking about just science in general like the in-depth of the science. I'm like, I know you don't have the time. That's, they're glad you don't have the time. They're really glad. They're I'd, happy. Like an, I'd like to make an announcement to Christians. Anybody Christians listening to this? Yeah. Oh, you just started recording? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. All right. So um, I was always accused of Christ, by, by Christians that I would argue with on construction sites and other places. That like, I'm regurgitating <laughs> to be a singer. At that time, I had not, I've heard of his name, but I had not like watched his videos or read anything of his. Yeah. But there was a lot of overlap because it's the same ideas. You know, he's not the only one who, who knows how to, you know, how to discuss, how to, how to address these issues that Christians sure. bring up, right? Sure. But I, I'm officially now have read, I have a book, I ordered from so you're saying, well, I haven't read it yet. I'm mm -hmm. gonna read it. Mm -hmm. It's called Let's Get Biblical. So far yeah. I've looked at it. I've seen everything <laughs> that he's written before. Maybe yeah. somewhere in the book there's something that I haven't seen yet. So, yeah. so now Christians can officially say I'm a I'm a I'm a Tovia singer wannabe. Yeah. No, I told one of the guys, I'm like, go on YouTube and check out Tovia Singer. And you know, probably he won't because he's afraid to hear what, what's in there. He's I mean, they definitely think he's the Antichrist. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he is. <laughs> he is, proudly. Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oy, so, this is dedicated to your brother, this episode. For sure. Which lame Velvel, Velvel, Lots of ups and downs. There was a big, last night was a rough night. Yeah, I heard. And um, today there was a basically miraculous yeah. uh, turnaround, but he's still intubated. And he sure. just, just before we spoke, just before we started speaking, uh, I talked to my mom and nephew. Mm -hmm. And there was a problem with the tube. And it was, you know, uh, and you know he was he was having trouble breathing, and then they it took them a while. They started getting worried again. It took them a while. Then they figured out 
how to deal with the tube but to get you know it's it's always it's a very it's very delicate you know so it's like i i fear celebrating too soon yeah not because i don't think there's going to be a celebration but i just want it the celebration to be at the appropriate time yeah for sure for me a big winning if when he wakes up and breathe and breathes comfortably because that's been um that's been the past couple of weeks uh since june actually since early june yeah it's been uh he hasn't been able to to breathe he's been like essentially like lightheaded and delirious and he started getting confused and passing out and stuff like that so right. so god willing when when they finally wake him up hang on one second yeah. When they, when they finally wake him up, uh, he's going to be able to breathe much more comfortably because um, it would seem that the tumor that was blocking his heart, uh, you know, the blood flow has mm -hmm. reduced uh, by a lot. Yeah, and and it and now there is a you know a normal essentially a normal blood flow. So so if God would just let him wake up and breathe, yeah, yeah. Uh, then it'll be a much much uh, better situation than yeah. was going into yeah. it definitely. And uh, there was uh, by the way. Uh, Greg's first yawn. <laughs> so this is going to be a short. Oh, no, it was not a yawn. I, I'm, 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 I'm listening. Don't lie to me. <laughs> it was not a yawn. Believe me, it was not a yawn. All right. No, it's just been like interesting trip. Yeah, man. Did you? Um, I don't know if I have said this out loud or I thought it. Did you? Mm -hmm. um, did I? Did I ask you to make Russian and Hebrew versions of the stickers? You did, but I need to find a printer. Oh, okay. I need to find a printer. Yeah. I need to. I need to get more active with it. And our friend actually. Uh, I mean, granted, I'm probably gonna see him for like a day. <laughs> our friend Ben is coming here not uh, next Shabbos, right before next Shabbos, the following Shabbos. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> but actually, this Shabbos, I'm going to the home of. Um, this guy, Daniel, the guy that runs the uh, shitter group for non, non injected, I guess you could say. The rejected? The rejected, yeah. So he invited me to his house. The Lonely Hearts Club? Yeah. Something Todd like Shepherd's that. Lonely Hearts Club? Yes. So I'm yeah. going to his house. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know what, like, we just interviewed Rabbi Kesson. I didn't see it yet. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll send it to you. But, the, like, you know, he's saying that all, well, obviously we know that it's not an accident that, like, the Israeli government and Roe versus Wade happened on the same week. You know, the repeal. Yeah. And he said this may be just the whole, or the collapse of the Israeli government. Um, he said this may just be the, um, it could be, um, you know, the turnaround point for everything. Um, obviously, like you said, we shouldn't celebrate too soon. But um, it could be the turnaround point. You know what's driving me nuts? Like, what? we get news that the government collapsed, yeah. and yet it's still functioning, and it's still... It didn't collapse like it. it well, it it, it collapsed. It's just it's just there's procedure now. It's just he has you know it's it's, it's literally like he's the care. You know, what's his name? Lapid is the caretaker prime minister. And now there's going to be an election, so they can't have an election the next day. You know. So Natalie Bennett is gone. He's not functioning anymore. He is now the you know he's now the um, uh, whatever alternate prime minister or something like that. Whatever. It's just like it switches. But he's, it's just the whole thing is going to be for another four months, basically, until October 22nd. Mm. You know, can't come soon enough, right? <laughs> but it, it's not like it matters. because It's just like, what's the alternative? You know, like BB and whatever. 
you know, BB and like Haredim and, 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 you know, these like Datilumi weaklings and like uh, maybe like a, a party from the opposition that like decides to go over to them just so there's no stalemate. Like what, 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 what do we get? You know what I mean? I'm not thinking about that. I'm looking at it as a, as a, as a vessel, as a vacancy, as, yeah. a, as a vacuum, right? For sure. Yeah. Um, I'm not looking for anybody in the Israeli government as a solution. No, no of course not. For sure not. But it's nice to see that the garbage government collapsed, okay, just because, well, you know why, you know? So, and it's funny that <laughs> the same day that they, that they do Roe Ro versus Wade, the reversal here in the United States, the Israeli government makes it, relaxes the laws on abortion. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. It's, it's very sad. It's like, we're, we're supposed to be the leaders of the world. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like, I, I, I think I sent you this. I, I interviewed a woman. Uh, she's the first Jewish... Uh, it's basically the first Jewish organization, like Orthodox Jewish organization for pro-life. And, um, you know, she was interviewed by a few of these publications, you know, Jewish backward, what I like to call them. Yeah. And they basically uh, wrote that, you know, she, that this woman represents, her name is Cecily Rotman, Cecily Rotman, that she represents the minority of opinions in, 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 in the Jewish world. And I joked with her, I'm like, uh, Depends what they mean by Jewish world. If it's obviously, like, obviously the, the person saying that thinks that the majority of the Jewish world yeah. is not religious. Well, if you count all the Jews, yeah, it's not. But if you're talking about the Torah, you know, so she's basically the first per, like Jewish voice for pro-life. And I asked her, I'm like, should we why are we not speaking out loud? Why is the Orthodox world, you know, I, I know that when the Orthodox Jewish world, let's say in America, you know, makes any kind of appearance on any made, you know, mainstream television screen, people listen. You know, I don't know if you remember, there was like a, a famous episode, not that I watch Oprah, but there was like a famous, you can go on YouTube, there was like a, a actually Lubavitch woman yeah. went on Oprah. And there was a whole thing about mikvah, you know, and the whole audience of Oprah is like women. Yeah. And she's talking about mikvah, and she actually took Oprah to a mikvah. I think it was in Crown Heights or somewhere. And uh, this is clear, it showed her the whole thing and sanctity and all this kind of stuff. And like people were just, you know, Oprah was interested in like, the, you know, these women, they were like enthralled. And I'm thinking like, <clears throat> this is not the first time I've seen this. You know, there was a famous story recently, I think a couple of years ago, that guy, Orthodox guy returned like uh, he found like a bag of fifty thousand dollars, you know, and he returned that it. it was like a kiddush Hashem, and he was like he was like on every show, dude. Like when when Orthodox Jews are in the spotlight, the world listens. When when a person is coming in the name of Torah, whether you agree or not, the world listens. Yeah, so I'm asking like, what are we doing? Why are we silent in this discussion? Why are we letting evangelical Christians who get who are just like lampooned clowns who are treated like you know they're being lampooned by by the you know media political establishment? Why are we letting them handle this? Clearly, it's not working. You know, hold on, hold on. Agudas Israel made a big yeah. public statement. That's the biggest Orthodox Jewish for sure. But, but are they on television? They, they wrote a state, they wrote a, a true box, a, you know, a, a statement on, on written, but, but, but they're not appearing with the exception of like when the, you know, when the cameras come to, uh, what do we, we have the CM Hashas, right? Yeah. Yeah. They come and they film, you know, rabbis talking, whoop de do but there's no rabbi coming out holding, you know, like Rabbi Kahana, you know, Rabbi Kahana used to have like a press conference as the national press club in Washington, yeah. D.C., yeah. And the world really had their ears perked up to hear what Rabbi Kahana wants to say, agree or disagree. It was like these famous, he did this more than once. 
famous statements. And he went on this and he went on that. He spoke to, I don't know, Charlie Rose, I think it was. It was like big shows. He was on a lot of talk shows, yeah. Yeah, like famous, like Morton Downey Jr. Remember this guy? Yeah, sure. It was the same set as when Jackie Mason had a show. They had the same studio, that we used, Channel 9, UPN, whatever, before it was UPN. He went on that that show, you know. Morton Downey Jr. was on for a long time. Yeah. I remember, like, for a huge chunk of my childhood. Yeah. Like, he made an impact. Let me look this guy up right now. Morton huh. Downey Jr. Unbelievable. Oh man, he passed away. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah the Morton Downey Jr. Show. I remember there was like yeah. this big, like in the opening credits, there's like this big mouth. Yeah. The teeth, and then yeah. in inside, he used to have like he used to have like fights. He used to fight like fisticuffs on that show. Yeah, he was the pioneer of trash TV. <laughs> yeah, except except these were real. It wasn't like Springer where it's like fake. Or, or, or staged. These were real discussions. He had like, uh, you know, some black leaders, whatever. He had like, he had like the Ku Klux Klan and yeah. the Klan at the same time. Versus like, he, he, he literally invited the people that hate each other the most and had them like just like talk. He tried to have them talk, which was actually, I think it was very healthy. As opposed to today, where just like, they're all, everybody's on Twitter calling each other racist for no reason. In 1984, you know? Did you say hello? Like, you can't hear me? Yeah, no, I thought you were. No, no, I'm listening. In 1984, mm -hmm. at KFBK Radio, Downey used the word Chinaman while telling mm -hmm. a joke. <laughs> oh, my God. His use of the word upset portions of a sizable Asian community in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. One Asian American city councilman called for an apology and pressured the station for Downey's resignation. Yeah. This is in 84. Downey refused to apologize and was forced mm -hmm. to resign. Do you know who replaced them? Was it Howard Stern? Nope. Was give it you one, give you one more guess? On the, it was on the radio. Oh, oh, was it um was it Imus? Uh keep going. Was it Opie and Anthony? No, this is 1984. Opie and Anthony. Oh, yeah, well, that's way before then. Right, right, right. No. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, El Rushbo. So El Rushbo, the, <coughs> the, the Maharishi, mm -hmm. with talent on loan from God, came and yeah. replaced Morton Downey Jr. Wow, I have no idea. Yeah, on the radio, 1984. Yeah. And then Morton Downey Jr. got his show on, you know, Channel 9, W O R, W W R, 1987. Right, into yeah. caucus, caucus, and then he got national syndication in 1988. I'm just reading the yeah, Downey fans became known as loud mouths, patterned after the studio's lecterns decorated with gaping cartoon mouths in which Downey's guests would go head to head against each other on their respective issues. No wonder he was hated so much. He is no. just, this is probably like the last right wing guy to have, mm -hmm. to have any presence on TV ever. Listen to this. It says, yeah, he particularly enjoyed making his guests angry with each other, which on a few occasions resulted in physical confrontations. One such incident occurred in 1988 show taped at the Apollo Theater involving Al Sharpton and core national chairman Roy, because uh, Roy Innes was like all about, you know, not, you know, basically he was like wanted to uh, black people. I, I saw this. This is on YouTube. You know what? Look, I, I want to play this. This is, was quite, they fought. They had a fisticuffs. Okay. Yeah, so it says it culminated in Innes shoving Sharpton into his chair, because Sharpton was really fat at that time. He was okay. like, knocking him to the floor and down and intervening separate. Yeah, this is, it was like, actually, here. Wait, uh, so who shoved, uh, wait, who shoved? This, this Innes guy, who's like, who was like, looked like a linebacker. Uh, they were sitting next to each other. Yeah, here. God bless uh, that Here, listen to this. Yeah, oh, they were talking about the Tawana Brawley case because because basically Sharpton obviously fabricated, you know, this whole situation. And Innes was like, this is stupid, you know, we're like making ourselves look bad. Yeah. 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 Y
But I got to do it in a way that's nice. I don't want to walk out of here with ice. You can hear it, right? Talk about when I'm in town, you and me biz going to get it down. Can you hear it? Yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, this is in the Apollo Theater. My goodness. He's singing some kind of jazz song. What? Was that Morton Dowdy Jr. singing a jazz song? Yeah, he was rapping with these guys on the street in Harlem. <laughs> See, this is back when you could do this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. 1988. <laughs> oh, there they loved him, man. It's like a mostly black crowd. Yes. Wow. Amazing. I'm going to skip to the parts where it's like it's Sharpton and uh, hold on, hold on. really don't address is the white people trying to tell black people who their leadership should be. One of those problems is addressed amazing. because the white people, we haven't been able to pick too many good leaders. What an amazing well, show. who does pick the leadership and what is leadership? <coughs> it was Martin Luther King. Certainly it's a Jesse Jackson. He got 7 million votes. <laughs> Yeah, can you remember that? Unbelievable. What? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, Jesse Jackson was like really a front runner uh, for Democrats. Uh, but, you know, it was him and Dukakis, I remember. Tonight, I want to introduce you. I want to introduce you to two. One very good friend of mine, Roy Innes. And another gentleman. Yeah, they're all like, think he's Uncle Tom. Why do they hate Roy Innes? Because they think he's an Uncle Tom. Wow. Okay. It was an organization called, called Core. Like you basically you wanted black people to you know pull themselves by the bootstrap, and then you see like Sharpton sitting there with fat tuchus. And the interesting dichotomy of it all. <laughs> another good friend, Al Sharpton. Oh oh Charlton. Everybody's packing up. Al, Al and I have gone out drinking together, but he uses it on his hair. <laughs> You're not smiling tonight. No sense of humor tonight. Gentlemen, uh, let me go first <clears throat> to Al. On last night's show, you had the audacity to praise Louis Farrakhan and call Roy Ennis a figure. Well, speaking of Farrakhan, yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, would you explain to Roy Ennis why he's a bigot? Well, I would not explain to Roy why he's a bigot. I'll explain to your audience. I was a person that I had respect for Mr. Ennis. Uh, Mr. Ennis in the late 60s uh, was a nationalist leader in this community. And many of the things that I praise Farrakhan for now in terms of self-help programs and in terms of having integrity, Mr. Ennis represented. But mm -hmm. in this transitional stage, uh, Mr. Ennis went from a man who would challenge a Bob Abrams to a man who would curtail and kowtow and back down to a Bob Abrams. You could hear the evil on him from day one. What did you say? You can hear the evil on Sharpton from day one. Oh, dude, he's, he's, he's a, just a snake. Now, Garbage. Friends, hmm. When a lot of ex-Corps members were making allegations, but when one uh, bum, who he knew was a bum, tried to, to, to turn on us, Roy, in his assignment, <clears throat> embraced them. Because anything that goes against our community, whether it's Bork, whether it's Bernard Getz, whether it's Tawana Brownlee, Roy Innes takes the... He was talking about Judge Bork, the, the, the guy who was nominated by Reagan to, go, to be in the Supreme yeah, Court. Yeah. Brilliant yeah. judge. He just wasn't like palatable the other side I don't think he that. what can you stop it for a second he said he mentioned he mentioned bernard uh, bernard gets right that's yeah the, that's the guy who was he, he was attacked by five dudes on a train and yeah. he was packing heat and he killed them right he shot them. yeah yeah subway shooting mm -hmm. so how so how are it's amazing how it's always twisted then, yeah even back then you know yeah. this guy, yep. These guys, these guys came and they were attacking some a complete stranger, yeah. right? Who defended himself, and all of a sudden, well, no. these guys who attacked them, wh why did they become these like national victims? Yeah, it's all good. Good riddance to them. Why yeah. wouldn't he be happy about that? 
Yeah. Well, you know, it's a victim mentality. Right. Feel that if Mr. Abrams, who has an active investigation on Roy, who Roy has said to me is using a Jewish plot mm -hmm. against him. If Mr. Abrams and IRS can make you get on your knees, Roy, fine. That's your problem. You should shut up and let those of us that have enough guts to stand up and fight, stand up and fight. Because there's some of us that investigations and indictments and the rest don't mean anything to. How you can go from a critic of Bob Abrams to an apologist of Bob Abrams makes you suspect <laughs> at best and a sellout in fact. <laughs> How does it feel to be classified as a bigot after a lifetime of fighting for civil rights? I will... I will say that I'm probably one of the... Now, please sip it. We're going to let everyone talk tonight. And that's what the loudmouths are for. Let these guys talk first. Go ahead. I'm one of the few non-bigoted black leaders run, I will say. Let me state now, let's deal with the facts. Let's go to the record. Tonight, we want to deal with the records and the facts. Please do it. On this program, your program, you heard me, you have me on tape defending this man. Recently, even after the shenanigans with him and the other... That's a lot of crap. No, no, brother, you have your time. Oh, here you go. Here you go. There they go. Oh, boy. There you go. He just put Sharpton on his pussy. Oh, oh, boy. Awesome. Oh, boy. Sharpton never got into a fight when the crowd wants to get involved. Sharpton has never... He's just... The, he's like the definition of a loudmouth piece of shit. He's never fought in his life. Yeah. Yet you get his ass whooped literally by anybody. You know oh, who has fought in his life? Don King. He's killed people. Well, Don King has committed armed robberies. If I'm not yeah. yeah. Not sure. Um, so, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Yes. <laughs> he sounds like at least, I mean, what? there's not a nickel's worth of difference between yeah. uh, the, the characteristics of Al Sharpton and Don King. They speak mm -hmm. with the same voice, the same clown show. Yeah. Right? yeah. Except Don Only in America. King, outrageous. Right. <laughs> Except Don King doesn't pretend to be a reverend. Yeah. No. Don King's just a, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's a, what is it called? It's a circus uh, impresario. Yeah. And I, and I don't think, the, the, there is a difference. I shouldn't, I don't want to insult Don King too much by comparing it to Sharpton. Yeah. Don King seems to love America. Yeah, supposedly. Right. Don King, Sharpton hates America. Well, he lo Don King loves what America brings him, which is money. Right. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's, a leg that's legitimate. You know, you can make money. You can, you mm -hmm. can become a success story yeah. in America. It's available. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that is a positive message. I mean, yeah. until this guy, you know, until the, the corpse in the White House, yeah. uh, you know, is, is through with his business. I mean, we'll see if that, if that, if that remains to be the case, but yeah, yeah, man. How the hell did we get into Sharpton? How do we do that? How, do we, fall, how do we fall into these pits every time? I we... don't know, but can can I ask you? I wanted to actually. Speaking of Don King, not so much about Don King, but something to do with Don King. Um, I stumbled upon a video from like two weeks. Somebody posted this two weeks ago. Um, it happened two weeks ago. Mike Tyson talking to uh, Schmalik Schmones, okay. believe it or not, uh, on a podcast. I believe it. And they, and they were talking about, you know, like life and death. And um, Mike Tyson started saying something that actually made me think of you. And uh, it made me think that you would really vehemently <laughs> disagree with what, what Mike Tyson uh, I want to play this for you, what Mike Tyson said in this video. Um, but let me find the particular clip because there was a few of them together on the same, on different programs. Just one second. 
<clears throat> um, it's like a very short clip, and they are talking. Here we go. Okay. There, there you go. So basically, there's so many beautiful moments. Here. You optimistic about the future of humanity? Big time. You hear that? Most of the great scholars, yeah. the great leaders, when they died, they believed the life was going to go down with them, and life is going to die. That's our ego. Life prospers after everything. And even at its worst, it prospers. Life prospered in slavery. That life is going to always prosper and become more and more powerful. This world is not going nowhere. I agree, because there's a theory of entropy in science saying everything's breaking down, but life is actually expanding. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. So in, 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 in your years on Earth, what do you think the ultimate secret is? I mean, I guess you kind of said at the start of, of our talk, I, I, I wrote a few notes while you were speaking earlier, but that being born is dying, but, be, but dying is being born. Yeah. I mean, I said we're, we're process of dying. Because once you die, once you're born, the process begins. We can't stop from dying. And it's so beautiful because as, as time goes on and the process of dying goes on, there's so many beautiful moments that then dying becomes, um, you know, it's not even that important anymore. Like you're sitting with Mike Tyson and sharing his tobacco with him. Thank you, sir. Tobacco, that is a magic tobacco, moment. Great tobacco, magic tobacco. Wait, wait, can you rewind that? Can, can you rewind that? Yeah. What? what I... He's basically saying, he basically said that, like, you know, you, you as soon as you're born, you start dying. And uh, he basically said, like, the beautiful part about he's a beautiful part about it is that you know you get to share moments. And it's like in the process of that whole thing, you know, like life. Uh, you get to share moments with people in this and but it's like by the time you you you're a nifter, it doesn't even matter anymore because you're just like okay, so like that's what it is. Yeah, that's the part I, that I missed. I didn't get why. So he's he's he was about to. I think he was about to get into that. Okay. We can't stop from dying, and it's so beautiful because as as time goes on and the process of dying goes on, there's so many beautiful moments. Then then dying becomes, um, you know, it's not even that important anymore. Like you're sitting with Mike Tyson and sharing his tobacco with him. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that is a magic moment. Great tobacco, magic tobacco. Thanks, sir. So tell me, you married? I am. Tell me, tell me what's your family? What is it? Did it worry? You worry about your kids? Uh, that's all I you know, If I have worries about them, you know. What's your view on what's currently happening with the Russia situation? Yeah. I just wanted to like, so what do you think of what he said? That it does that dying doesn't matter because you because you spend beautiful moments. Yeah, no, like basically it's like it doesn't, yeah. I I I deeply, deeply disagree with him obviously i'm not disagreeing with him about spending beautiful moments that's obviously important i'm i disagree that that it's it's okay that they end <laughs> do you understand yeah those beautiful moments should not end that's yeah. that's where i disagree so you know i would ask him how many beautiful moments does it take for it not to be become a tragedy he'll probably say something like even one even one you know, you know why Tyson is like this right now? Because he, I think he's experimenting with like DMT stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like, because I noticed that people who experiment with DMT and ayahuasca, like, you know, they have like the really heavy trips, yeah. like they, they go somewhere else. They really do. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they go to another dimension. Huh. In a sense, they realize that they're not stuck here. Like they know that there's something else going on. And that's why they have this cavalier attitude. Yeah. Right. So he's not really mentioning that. But that, 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 I can hear it in his voice. He seems to be of that mindset. And I think they're probably stoned in this interview because Mike Tyson. They're, probably, they're, they're getting there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when he said tobacco, he probably meant weed. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, when, when you're high, you, you're, you're, you say stuff that doesn't make sense, you know? Yes. And, uh, and I, I think that somebody like Mike Tyson gets away with saying things that don't make sense a lot because <laughs> you gotta be, you gotta be Lennox Lewis to even, you know what I mean? Like, what? <laughs> 
to even like you know i mean i would do it but obviously like that's the problem I, I probably should never meet somebody like mike tyson because i would not be able to like if i can't say what i feel is the truth right yeah. i'm not gonna i'm not gonna even start the conversation no but i think tyson would be okay with like a person with a different opinion he's not he's not like one of these like uh i mean it used to be that way i think <laughs> i think i think he's pretty like i don't know I, I find him to be like a fairly intelligent guy no no he is no he's intelligent but yeah. but because because he's mike tyson certain yeah. people like like his guests i noticed right yeah. a lot of times they won't contradict him because they fear him yeah you know what I mean? When he, he's like, yeah. intelligent people say dumb stuff from time to time. And then if nobody's scared of them, yeah. you know, somebody's going to say, ah, that's stupid, right? Yeah. You're not going to, they're not going to say that to Mike Tyson. Yeah. As intelligent as he is, he, 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 he doesn't really know when someone agrees with him or not. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also like, how should I put this? A lot of these, a lot of these guys who are like, have these, these, um, podcasts you know it all goes back to like they're, they're not coming you know they're, they're, what i noticed they're exploring let's say you know different philosophies you know like uh like tyson likes to talk a lot about you know like these old um or the ancient you know like these ancient uh what is it conquerors or ancient philosophers yeah yeah he likes that he likes to talk about charlemagne like, and, and yeah like charlemagne, like charlemagne confucius and all that so they talk about all these different things and they're just like exploring this hodgepodge of philosophy, right? So, and a lot of these guys, like I noticed he has like, you know, he has this podcast called Hotbox. Hotbox, Hotbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have no idea what the hell they're talking about because again, it's just like this like um, Tower of Babel philosophy class, you know? As opposed to like, if, if somebody like you and I comes in and says, well, here's what the Torah has to say about what you're talking about, right? Either it reconciles or, or, you know, contradicts or partially agrees, whatever it is. But all these guys are doing, they're just kind of like shooting the breeze and, and you know, th they're trying to uh, throw something on a wall and see what sticks. So I think it's not even that they're afraid to contradict them. It's just, I think they don't, they just don't know. A lot of these guys just don't know what's flying. That's what it seems like to me. Some of them, yeah. But I've, I mean, seen, like, I've seen his Jordan podcast. Peterson, Jordan Peterson knows what's flying. <laughs> yeah. I've seen his podcast, okay? And and I don't know. Jordan Peterson, great guy, but I don't see him as having... What's the... I'm looking for this word. I you're, don't talking know about, uh, you're talking about cachet? No, I was going to say gump, gumption, but that's not the right word. Oh, cachet, cachet the cachet, like the, 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 the weight, the gravitas. Hang on, let me let me let me just make sure. I don't know why this word popped into my head. That's very odd. One second. No, actually, no. I I think that was, I think that I think it was almost correct. Like gumption means they don't he doesn't have uh, the energy or the spirit, yeah, to kind of take on Mike Tyson when he says something that's not right. Or that he that he, whatever you know if, if anybody would disagree with him right yeah. I've seen his podcast and, and I've noticed I, I feel nervous for the guests a lot mm. because I can see when they get a little when they get a little yeah. worried I saw one with uh, with uh, Captain Kirk yeah Louis, uh, what was it uh, William Shatner yeah <laughs> That's funny. so what happened with that Shatner's just like he doesn't care. Shatner was actually interesting. Shatner, um, when he he didn't directly challenge Tyson, but when he when he let's say didn't agree with something, he yeah. waited for a couple of seconds when yeah. when the subject kind of was changing a little bit, and then he asked the question. But wouldn't you feel? How do you feel about this? Yeah. Right. The question itself was a statement. Yeah. It's better to do it that way than say I disagree with you. It's not better, but it's, you know. No, it's more, it's more like, it's not threatening. That's what I mean. Right. It's, no, but it's not better. It's just, it's, it's more of a survival skill when you're scared. Yeah, for sure. You know, and um, 
listen, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not easy to talk to. It's not, listen, he's, you know, enlightened Mike Tyson. Yeah. He's still Mike Tyson. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, yeah, he still knocked you out. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, you, you know, no. most of the world, you know, the only context they've ever seen him is just knocking d- giant dudes out. In like 30 seconds. <laughs> just like these, ir- ir- irrationally. These mountains, these yeah. like human behemoths, just yeah. like chopping them down like trees, yeah. right? And that's how yeah. people saw him. And and then they saw him act all crazy when you know yeah when, in the somebody 90s. bit his somebody bit his ear and then somebody did this and somebody did that yeah yeah it, it, there was like one clip I I I don't know I just find myself some, once in a while, blue moon watching all those very quick knockout videos of Tyson yeah there was one where like they interviewed the guy you know his you know would be opponent and the guy already had like a pretty formidable record. Um, he was not much, you know, let's say if Tyson was like 19 at the time, the guy was like 23, 24, he was like an old guy. And the guy was just like, yeah, so, you know, this is like a warm up fight for me. He considered Tyson because Tyson just came like, I don't know, I think it was like his fifth fight, Tyson's. So the guy was like, he thought Tyson was like a noob, you know, like, like, a, like a rookie. Like, yeah, it's gonna be a warm up fight for me. I'm looking forward to, you know. Uh, warm, warming up for you know my main fight after this, whatever. Trash talking never, never serves yeah. anybody. It wasn't even like trash talking. The guy was just being very cavalier. He was just he, he was looking past Tyson. He was just like no, this that, is- no, that's trash talking. Obviously, obviously he knew that treating a fighter like that, right? Yeah. That's trash talking. Like you, like a fighter is getting into the ring with you. I mean, it is, but it's like <sighs> that's even worse than know. trash talking. That's worse. Big kids are Tyson basically like <laughs> eviscerated him. He, like he like made this guy buried under the canvas. Like, he, atomized, just, he atomized him. Yeah, he just like, like yeah, he turned them. And my mom likes to say when privatil malia, he turned them into molecules. Yeah. Malia, malia, you know? That's that's it was just hilarious. Really, it was just like they showed the really, whole that's really whole, different. That's really different than what I said. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know. Do you remember? Do you remember <laughs> uh, when this guy, this uh, I think he was a Polish fighter, Galota. Yeah, Galota. He used to punch people in the balls, right. all the time by accident, quote unquote by accident. No, I'm not. I'm not sure, but I don't know if I dreamed this, but I think there was a fight that they were scheduled to have where Galota actually came out, uh-huh. and Tyson was already in the ring. He saw Tyson yeah. and said no, and just said no. That's it. It no. was. It, I don't know if it was in the beginning. Here, it wasn't the first fight. It was. I'll tell you. Um, yeah, he. It was like the second round, and he just like he quit. He quit. No, 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 no. It was a. Uh, it wasn't even the second round. I'm talking about a fight where he didn't even get it to the ring. Ah, uh, uh, here. He yeah. kind of looks like the Klitschko, like the Klitschko brothers. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Scared fire refused to fight Tyson after, uh, after Tyson. No, because Tyson dropped him. He 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 knocked him down. He did a knockdown. They fought, and then Golota left. And here, this is the interview after he left. Golota here. Mike has decided to uh, leave the ring. We're going to go back into the uh, locker room and try and speak with him yeah. then. Uh, the crowd is stunned. They can't believe it. What happened? First of all, what's my day today? But the head but a referee didn't respond pretty much well as as he's supposed to. Yeah, but you're a warrior, Andrew. You're a fighter. But you're you're a fighter. The the crowd pays business, and in the, in the, in I get it. Said, what made you dizzy? Was it that first knockdown? What, what about the knockdown? Did you did you really recover from that knockdown at the end of the first round? Actually, I was just slipped. You know, I I I, I hadn't been hit by a I just I was slip was slip on the down. Then uh, I said that. The kids are man. I, I can't listen. It, it's too it's too humiliating. I, I feel bad bringing it up. Actually, Tyson knocked him down. Golota sensed that this is going. He's going to be another one of the one of the casualties, and he was just like, screw it. <laughs> I'm out of here. No, but he was saying that he was saying that the the referees weren't 
doing what they're supposed to do, right? Like they, yeah, there was like a headbutt. Tyson he headbutted. Headbutt, he was getting headbutted, and he didn't want to. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a cut in his head. You could tell. You look at it above his eyes. A cut in his head. Dude, Golata. Can I say something about this guy, Golata? I remember I used to like follow him a little bit. He's one of the the most t- talented boxers in history. And he literally is like a, a very, his career is like a sad story. The guy, yeah, I'm looking at, yeah, he, he, could, he could have been one of the greatest, this guy, Golota. And he basically, you know, he blew it by like, basically with a screwed up head and punching people in the balls. See, he lost the Riddick Bow and Lennox Lewis. But like, yeah, see, he, says, uh, he lost the Riddick Bow twice in a row. Glo- disqualified for repeated low blows twice, but both both fights. Yeah. And then Lennox Lewis, whatever, Lex Lewis just beat him because Lex Lewis was just Lex Lewis. But like it, it was just it's one of the sad stories, Galata. He was like really, he was undefeated until he fought Riddick Bowe. He won 28 straight fights. Um yeah, I just remember I remember this guy. He like he was notorious. But punch people in the balls, and then he had a failed, and then he had a failed drug test. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, it goes it's, in the territory. Well, <sighs> at least he. Oh, I was gonna say at least he beat. No, he lost to uh, John Ruiz. He lost to John Ruiz, Lehman Brewster. He lost to. Uh, he lost to like all the great fighters actually. He lost to this. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Oh, he beat Kevin McBride. You know that guy? Yeah. He Kevin McBride is actually the guy who beat Tyson in Tyson's like uh, Twilight. Basically, I think it was his last fight. Tyson's last fight was Kevin McBride. And he was like fighting farmers and stuff. Like anybody would come out to. Yeah, he was just like he literally was like, I just need the money. And he's like, What, Mike? What, so why did you? What made? He's like, Yeah, I got to feed my family. I just need the money. You know, I'm not. I'm not so. He's like, I ain't have the heart for boxing anymore. <laughs> I don't have the heart in it. My heart's not in it. Jim Gray, I'm not. <laughs> Jim Gray, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I just came out here. I got to feed my, my daughter. My daughter got out of prison. You know, I can... <laughs> Yeah. Whatever. I just saw something on YouTube. Unfortunately, it was produced by Jimmy Kimmel, right? Oh, that's but it crazy. wasn't. But it... But at least it didn't, it didn't include him, his voice or his stupid face. Praise the Lord. It was like, I think it was somewhere in, could have been San Diego, San Jose, I'm not sure, where they were stopping people on the street and asking them who their, who their, who their you know, greatest sports star is, yeah. like, the greatest athlete, right? And then, like, they'd ask him about, like, Mike Tyson, right? And then, you know, the people would, like, start giving their opinion, and then Mike would walk out. <laughs> you know, just like kind of, you know, stand behind them. Oh yeah, my, it's called Mike Tyson standing behind you. I didn't see it. I just so I keep I keep popping up my feet. I just did purposely didn't watch it. The last one, the last like the la- like the last person, or there's actually uh, uh, twin girls, right? Mm-hmm. Like like young ladies, and uh, she, one of them was smart enough to say, "What well, is, is you're asking about Mike Tyson? Or is he here? Oh, that he's the greatest. He's a, and then Mike Tyson comes mm-hmm. out at that moment, right?" <laughs> Yeah. The smartest one ever. It's funny. Here. Uh, Mike Tyson behind you. Yeah, it's right behind you. That's this one. <laughs> yeah. There's a new list that just came out of the greatest athletes of all time. Who would you put at number one? Number one, all time Michael Jordan. And at number two? Number two would probably be uh, Muhammad Ali. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and, uh, it's a tight one. It's a uh, Tiger Woods or um, Pele. Okay. Well, well, uh, we uh, still haven't got to Mike Tyson. Now, where does he land on the list? He's my favorite boxer of all time, but he's probably around. Oh, wait. Please tell us. How do you like Conor McGregor? Great. He's absolutely done great things for Ireland. That's a difficult question. I don't know. Can't they both have the aggression? I'm gonna to have to go with Connor because he's Irish, though. So. 
Uh, tell him. What I think of him? Um, it's kind of crazy. He's very lucky that I'm a peaceful man. <laughs> He's had a, a past, I guess. You know, I, I feel like if you get hit up beside the head that many times, it kind of. Well, that was a black kid, kid, right? He was, he was yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still very entertaining to watch. You know, Mike. What do you think? Are you crazy? I think oh I my am. god! <laughs> <laughs> you think you and your prime could go in the ring with Mike oh Tyson goodness. now? Yeah, I'll give it a go. Okay, here we go. Let's do this. Mike Tyson versus Butterbean. Butterbean. <laughs> You know, Sorry. people said. You know, people have actually said to me. People what? People have actually said to me, "Oh, what a fight that would be, Mike Tyson and Butterbean." No, it would not, dude. But putting Butterbean is like putting is like putting a like I don't know, like a I don't want to say a fat pig. It's not nice, but some kind of animal like that into a ring with a with a hungry tiger. Yes, you understand? Like, yeah. like he can hit. But yeah. he can't move. Yeah. Dude, Tyson could still move. He's like 55 years old. He can still move. Still. Yeah. And I, by the way, by the way, if Butterbean's listening, Butterbean, I would not want to fight you. You got a crazy hit. Like, I don't want to get hit by you. Okay. You kill me. All right, Butterbean. But we're talking about Mike here and you're a little out of shape. Okay. Yeah. All right. Butterbean. Just to get the Butterbean off my chest. Is five years old and he's a lot. Brookshire, he's alive. Thank God. Who? Butterbean. But yeah, no, Butterbean fought recently. Oh, yeah? What? I think so. No? Oh, no, maybe I just watched one of his fights on YouTube recently. That's what I'm... 2013. That's a little closer to the... That's his last fight. 2013? Yes. Remember they when he knocked him. out Johnny Knoxville? He lost... Oh, my God. He lost his last three fights. Do you, uh, remember, do you remember when he knocked out Johnny Knoxville? I... In Jackass? I guess I mean I, I don't know if I saw. Dude, it. look it up. Look it up on YouTube. Butterbean knocks out Johnny Knoxville, or Butterbean Jackass, something like that. Second. Yeah. Yeah, Knoxville's crazy. Yeah, that's, Butterbean that's, versus Johnny Knoxville. Imagine fighting Johnny Knoxville. You know, that's kind of scary because I don't know, he probably can't fight, but it's scary to fight a dude who can take out a pain. Hmm. All right, go on, go on. Yeah, <laughs> Department store boxing. <laughs> the hell? Yeah, so, yeah. Round one. Guys, touch box and come out fight. We're just gonna fight him. Oh, oh. oh my god. 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 That's crazy, right? Oh. Dude, he oh. really he, he really knocked his ass. Yeah. Oh my god. One more time. That's it. Oh my God. He's just throwing those overhand rights. Yeah. Oh, dear Lord. And he, and he just disappears behind like a counter. In one of the yeah. Johnny Knoxville gets hit by Butterbean and disappears on the floor somewhere in a, in a department store. I think it was the was it the uh, the perfume section or something like that? Or the jewelry? Butterbean okay. Yeah, it's butterbean okay. okay. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. They hit him on the top of the head. All the people are like, what? My knockout in the first round, dude, champion, butterbean. Woo! Yeah! All right, all right. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about something else. Hey, let's talk Every about time a white man talk about boxing, you gotta why, we gotta talk, why we always got to talk about something else. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, man. So, just to kind of swing it around a little bit. Yeah, you know, 
I'm, I'm very uh, sleep deprived, you know, yeah. kind of low energy. I don't know if you can hear, you can say I'm trying not to be, you know, and because um, the baby, the baby, the baby, man, the baby is, is the best that? reason I've ever, I've ever been forced to stay up in my life. It's awesome, man. He's, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's insane how much I, I love that guy. Yeah. I'm looking at him right now, you know? He's just sitting Where there. Did you, how did, I mean, I, I pretty much figure out how you came up with the name. Okay. How did three, I, no, I'm saying the three names. You know, you got the basically uh, Yehoshua, and then, and then you know, Raphael, which is a healer. And I think Nahum is what Nahum is. Well, it, it's, it's, it's related to Menucha or, or yeah. Noya. Comfort. Comfort, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, I think Nachum was one of the was one of the prophets, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Let me quickly look that up. But I'll tell you how it came up with the names. It's a weird story. Um. Well, we're calling him Rafi, you know, even though it's his second name, but we're calling him Rafi because it's uh, you know, it's with my, it's related to my uncle Felix. Yeah. Same. We talked about that. Like Falik is Rafuel. Actually, yeah. you. Actually, my, you, my grandfather, you educated me on that. I didn't. No, my grandfather. Yeah, he's he's feeling. I didn't know, but I didn't know that. You explained that to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, hold on a second. I'm looking for. It's funny you say that, man. Because if I have a son, uh, it's a, yeah. Nachum Nachum was a prophet. He's one of the. Yeah. yeah. He's he's one of the he's one of the the prophets that has like the like the the actual book itself is mm -hmm. not, is not very long. Right, like not like Yeheskel or not like uh, Shayahu with many. Yeah. And Nahum has three chapters. I mean, their their I mean, their impact is in, is immense. Yeah. But you know, you know, you know, Christians. I was curious, how do Christians say Nahum? Nahum, Nahum. Yeah, yeah. They like deliberately mispronounce everything. <laughs> I don't think no, it's not, not necessarily. I, I don't think they're, dude. I don't think the average like just person Christian. It's going out of their way to be, you know, to be a jerk. <laughs> no, they're not, they're not. Even these guys tonight, even these guys tonight, they're not trying to be like dicks. They're just, they're just, they just think that like what they're doing is right, which obviously it's not, but yeah, you know, they're actually like ostensibly nice guys. They're just like with stupid ideas. Yeah. They're doing it in a stupid way. So Interesting. You know, I, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you about like lost tribe stuff and, and stuff like that, because a lot of interesting things, I kind of like have been reviewing it, but we'll, we'll get to that like maybe later or another time. Yeah. Um, so the name Yehoshua, I had this, um, it's actually, this is before I even moved to Louisiana, it's like two years. Uh, prior to me moving to Louisiana, uh, let's say five years ago. Um, this is during Pesach, okay? Um, and I'm watching a, I'm watching, uh, not yet, hold on. I have a dream, okay? This is like the, the second, I think the second days of Pesach, mm -hmm. okay? And I have a dream that I'm in a shul, Okay. And the walls of the shul are like, you know, natural stone, right? With like plaster. It feels like, like, like so it could be someone like an old shul in Yerushalayim or maybe even Chevron, right? But like really old. And yeah. I'm standing by the bima. Okay. And <clears throat> it's really kind of like a, a, a really, like, I've never been to a shul like this before. It's small though. It's not, it's not, a, it's not like a big impressive place, but it's very, has a very warm feeling. And I hear people, I hear commotion, I hear voices and, you know, like, like it sounds like a full shul, but I don't see anybody. I'm just staring ahead at the wall, at these like stones, um, you know, just the, whatever, you know, the, whatever the wall is made out of, just these natural stones with plaster. And it was kind of like a, like a seafoam green color, you know, it was painted like a seafoam green color. And I hear a voice, an announcement being made. It said, shall his name be 
Mendel or Yehoshua. Mm-hmm. In my mind, I chose Yehoshua. Somehow, I don't know how I knew it, that that question was um, addressed to me. I just did. Okay. I chose Yehoshua. Then I woke up. Okay. This is like a really short, like I, got, I had this dream when I think when I was taking a nap, like during the day. So I just finished one of my long ass. Um, uh, this is like right before Yom Tov, in the last days of Pesach. Um, I was doing like Uber, like a lot. I was exhausted. So I took a, I took a nap and I woke up. Okay. And this dream was one of the most lucid, I guess, dreams I've ever had. I'd almost call it a vision, but it was not a vision necessarily because I was sleeping. Okay. But it was, this dream was so like the details of it was so, anyway, it made an impact on me. Okay. It's like, I could never forget it. Um, after the last days of Pesach, I, ha- I-, I watched this. Um, uh, There's a series of uh, classes that Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg was giving about the, the biblical, you know, the, the leaders, right? Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, right? Yosef and, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, going. And, and this particular one was about Yoshua ben Nun, right? And he was explaining how you know, there's a lot of things I'm, I'm going to forget, but he was explaining how Yehoshua ben Nun, this is like the second, um, uh, the second days of Pesach were connected to Yehoshua ben Nun. Like those are his days somehow. Like Moshe was connected to uh, the first days of Pesach and Yehoshua ben Nun is like somehow connected more to the last days of Pesach. If I'm not, if I'm not screwing this up, I'm going to have to review that. I should actually review that uh, that lecture. You still with me? He is not. I've lost him, folks. <laughs> Dude, you did it. You did it. What? You fell asleep. You oh, did it. <laughs> I knew it. It's okay. Oh, it's all right. Okay, so let's let's call this one. We tried. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, he did it. it I told you. It, it, it has it. no, but it has been. Uh, how long? Uh, it's been a good like uh, hour and seven minutes. <laughs> it has. It has. Oh goodness! You yeah, we gotta, we, we, you we're both not not the freshest. We no, didn't come to this uh, conversation. It, it's been two weeks. I. Um, I went to like some barbecue place, you know, one of these steak places. Yeah. And the guy, whatever, my friend knows, you know this guy, Eliakim Cohen? No. He's on Facebook. So he knows the owner. So the owner just gave us like free food. <laughs> and uh, which is like very, very nice of him, actually. And uh, I also had some, you know, Jack and ginger ale, apparently. And uh, yeah, I'm not drunk or anything. I'm just, it's just kind of like, it wears it down, you know? I hear you. So, you know, in order to salvage this, I, I do want to say that um, I'll just quickly finish up my Yoshua story really quick. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, um, so I had this dream, okay, that I picked the name Yoshua. It was a very lucid dream. Uh, I couldn't shake it. I felt like, perhaps you know i was getting a message now i'm not really one of those people but my my worry was well what if i am getting something and i and i ignore it that's not good either right and it's dude it's comical trying to talk to like rabbis about this kind of stuff yeah do you want to meet skeptics right about spiritual phenomenon yeah like just talk to rabbis who talk about talk spiritual phenomena all the time yeah, talk to people who are supposed to believe in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, oh, here's another one. Here's a. Mm-hmm. Here. As soon as I said, Rabbi, I had a dream. Here's so and so. It goes, oh, yeah, the eyes glaze over. You know what I mean? It's really hard to get anybody to take something like that seriously. It's not easy to talk about. But anyway, so I thought that for a couple of years, I thought that maybe I should change my name or add my name, add Yoshua to my name. Yeah. But uh, recently, 
you know, I, there's not that many people to talk about it with. So I, 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 I met some, I met a guy who is knowledgeable and open to having this kind of discussion and won't like, kind of like brush me off. Uh, so he said, let me, I told him the whole story about the dream. And he said, let me, uh, let me think about it. Let me dive in on it. I'll, you know, see, you know, see what I come up with. So he got back to me and he said, uh, is your wife pregnant? I'm like, you know, at this point, we, we didn't tell anybody. Nobody knew. And he's like, I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, but it's not right. And he's like, okay, so it's, uh, I, I, it should be for your son. Hmm. Well, that's how, that's how he got the name Yoshua. Well. Okay. And just, I wanted to mention one more thing. Um, and then I got to go quickly deal with the, with, with the baby. Um, mm -hmm. My brother had his procedure on Koyach Nisan. I'm Koyach Sivan, I'm sorry. Okay. Which is, uh, that's the day, that's a very big, important Lubavitch day. That's when Lubavitch Rebbe and, the, and his Rebbetzin arrived in, in America in 1941. Another amazing thing is that the Rebbe actually left America to go back to, to Europe to get his mother, right? And, yeah. and he got, I think he picked her up from France. And he arrived back in the United States again on Koyach, on Koyach Sivan. So that was, the, that was the day that my brother had his procedure. And uh, God willing, it's going to be a success. And I'm going to make that uh, a triple yeah. uh, personal Yom Tov. Uh, oh, yeah. and hopefully we can celebrate together and um, hopefully we can have better podcasts coming up and Greg's asleep again good night folks <laughs> I am not <laughs> yeah, you, okay I gotta go deal with the baby let's let's do this let's let's try this at a more normal hour for you man yes it's it's 1 a.m yes and uh I'm I'm at the I'm at the level of the baby I'm tired. Of, I can't deal with this many babies, folks. I got to go. <laughs> All right. Talk to you soon. All right, sir. All right. Mazel tov and uh, Mazel tov and uh, Rufua to your brother. Amen. And, uh, we should okay. only know good news. Amen. And Chodesh tov as well. Chodesh tov. Absolutely. We didn't talk about aliens. We didn't talk about lost tribes. We'll do that next time. Uh, yes, we thought the show. All right. right. All right. Nice to see you. Later. Later.